Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Brendan Vaughn. I am the editor-in-chief of Fast Company, which, if you're not familiar with that, is an American business magazine focused on innovation. Uh, we cover design, creativity, but innovation is the common thread. We certainly cover crypto uh, and other areas of finance. So um, I'm really excited to be here moderating this panel with a, a really impressive group of folks across a wide uh, spectrum of the industry um, with lots of different perspectives, and hopefully we'll be able to really get into that range of, of, of views and, uh, and talk about kind of the state of crypto right now, and particularly the state of um, the regulatory framework uh, worldwide. So um, let me quickly introduce these folks. I'm going to make my introductions pretty fast. No offense, guys, um, <laughs> because we have five panelists here, and we want to make sure that everybody has plenty of time to talk. So um, just going from my left, um, Paul, Mo, uh, Paul Mopo Chan is the Financial Secretary of Hong Kong. Paul is the Chairman of Hong Kong's new Web 3.0 Development Task Force, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit for sure. Um, next to Paul is Inga Mullins. She's the founder and CEO of Fluency Group, which is a CBDC, that's Central Bank Digital Currency, company based in the UK. Uh, she's advised governments in the US, UK, and UAE on their policies around CBDCs. Um, Moving on is Top. Uh, Top is the founder of group, uh, founder and group CEO, excuse me, of Bitcub Capital, a digital assets company based in Thailand um, that is currently expanding internationally. Um, Brad Garlinghouse is the CEO of Ripple Labs uh, and has previously worked at Yahoo and AOL, among other tech firms. He's also been an advisor to Silver Lake Partners. Um, and then finally on the end is Michael Schoenenschein as the CEO of Grayscale, uh, the crypto assets manager. Uh, before joining Grayscale, uh, Michael worked at J.P. Morgan Securities and Barclays Wealth and is a regular on CNBC and Bloomberg. Um, so before we get into regulation, which will be some but not all of our panel, um, I wanted to just talk about the state of crypto in general. And actually, I want to I sort of throw this to, to all of you. Um, you know, uh, the markets bounced back. Um, you know, governments worldwide um, struck a, a delicate balance between fostering innovation and ensuring the integrity of financial systems. So we'll get into the challenges and the different philosophical approaches um, to the, the whole idea of regulation around crypto. But um, yeah, let's set the stage where we are in the longer arc. Um, what's different, if anything, about this moment that we're in, this rally that we're in, and what can we learn from those differences? Um, Anyone can start if you want me to call them. Michael, let's start with you. Um, sure. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, I have to say, you know, being here in Davos with such a great panel and being able to talk about crypto uh, at the 2024 annual meeting, I have to say that crypto is in such a different place than we were even just a year ago. Um, a year ago, a lot of the headlines that surrounded crypto, the narrative was that crypto was dead, um, crypto was going to flame out, um, and we very quickly found ourselves in a crypto winter. I believe that with each successive crypto winter we've had, it's been a time for companies and businesses like those that are represented here on stage uh, to really build, um, to focus inwards a little bit and coming out of crypto winter, um, you've seen a tremendous amount of resiliency from the crypto community. Um, that's reflected in development work and certainly also reflected in prices, right? If you look back at 2023, Bitcoin was one of the highest returning assets of the year, if not the highest returning asset um, of 2023. Um, and so now as we're moving into this next phase, this next cycle. Um, you know, we certainly had a big win in the U.S. just last week with the approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs coming to market and believe that that can be a major, major catalyst for continued adoption, more capital infusion into the asset class. Um, and what I like to think is really, for a lot of folks, really weaving crypto into the fabric of the financial services ecosystem in a way that it candidly hasn't been before. Can I ask you to um, just dwell for another moment on the uh, approval of the, the Bitcoin ETFs. Um, help us understand, by analogy or just by other description, how big a moment this is for crypto, if, you, if there's something to compare it to from either the history of crypto or the history of a different part of finance or, or Yeah, anything. arguably it's one of the biggest milestones in Bitcoin since perhaps Bitcoin itself. Um, and I say that because the ETF wrapper, both in the US and other jurisdictions around the world, has really become tried and true way for investors to get exposure to all different types of assets. It could be commodities like gold and silver, or it could be S&P 500 exposure. Regardless, that ETF wrapper gives investors certain protections um, that they now enjoy. And you've seen how this has been 
a major accelerant um, in other asset classes. So for instance, in 2004, when the first gold ETF was approved in the United States, that was a major, major innovation that allowed investors to participate in gold in their investment portfolios in a way that they hadn't been historically. If you analogize that to where we are with Bitcoin, well now with spot Bitcoin ETFs on, in the market, people are adding Bitcoin exposure right alongside the stocks, the bonds, um, you know, really any of the assets they own in their brokerage accounts. Um, and that's a major innovation. You know, crypto has only been around for a little bit more than a decade. So it, it's a big moment. Brad? Uh, I'll echo, I think it's a huge moment. Uh, you know, I think if you look at the people's interest in the asset class, it's been very high. And Look, I think a lot of people don't want to set up a crypto wallet. They don't want to, you know, incur the extra risk of, you know, managing that themselves. And so the Bitcoin ETF thing is a very big deal. I think it, the institutions that are participating, you know, I've been involved in this industry for about 10 years. And, you know, having BlackRock as one of the yeah. ETF uh, providers, sponsors, what have you, uh, is a big deal. A added credibility to the whole industry. Yeah. And... Um, any more to say on the part of my question that was just about sort of the difference between this comeback and all of the other comebacks we've seen? Um, I think it's a natural question to wonder for people that might still be a little bit skeptical, is this just the same old cycle? Are we going to see it go down again? I mean, you know, all markets do that, of course, but I'd be curious to hear your perspective on that. Look, I think the remarkable thing is that Bitcoin is over $40,000. Uh, we've had massive headwinds in 2023. Uh, a lot of those were self-inflicted wounds. You know, uh, I was talking to a couple people before the panel. Over the last 18 months, you've had Celsius, Three Arrows, FTX, Binance, and yet here we are. You know, as Michael described, uh, in a really interesting, looking forward position. I'm extremely optimistic about 2024. So I, I think, uh, if anything, I, I, it's an opportunity to step back and really focus on some of the first principles. And what I mean by that is. Compliance always mattered. I think that you know we're now at a time, if we want crypto to flourish and achieve some of the things we want it to in the future, I think we have to make sure we stay true to those first principles. We have to make sure we're focused on something more than speculation. Utility has always mattered. I think sometimes we lost sight of that uh, in the fervor. But again, you know, people had, as Michael described, I think not, it wasn't so many Davoses ago that people were like, you know, Bitcoin's, it's, it's done. Yep. And uh, yet here we are. You, yeah. you certainly heard a lot of the Bitcoin is done. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, for us, from a government perspective, from a regulator perspective, I think we don't really care so much about up and down or up or down. I think the important thing is the market will be able to weather full ups and downs. That is important because individual assets valuation bound to fluctuate and sometimes could be volatile for a number of different reasons. Uh, for us as a regulator, it is to ensure uh, it is functioning orderly. And in terms of uh, risk management, it does not cause financial stability risk for that matter. Also in terms of investor protection, despite ups and downs, every asset go through that cycle. Investor protection, from our standpoint, being ensured is all right. So we in Hong Kong adopt a same activity, same risk, same regulatory requirement, that of conceptual framework in terms of providing a balanced regulation to virtual assets. And I'll just highlight, I think Hong Kong is one of the clear leaders in that ideology. And ironically, of course, I think the US is behind on that in a bunch of ways. I think we would both agree anyway, the SEC was dragged kicking and screaming to approve the Bitcoin ETF. Right. They kind of were forced to by a judge. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, let's get into the regulatory piece of this just for a sec. We can come back to some of these things. Paul, I'd like to hear more about the Web3 Development Task Force for sure, but let's table that for just a sec. Um, there are unique challenges to, uh, to regulating digital assets. Um, you've got very fast moving tech. You've got um, uh, a, a use case, uh, a range of use cases that also varies widely. Um, not a lot of clear guidance on which assets are commodities, which are securities. Um, the framework needs to be sort of broad enough to work for a very um, diverse industry, um, but specific enough to like provide 
actual clarity, uh, which would be helpful, right? Um, so, uh, Top, I'll go to you here. Um, what are some things that, in your experience so far, that you've seen that works? And what are some things that, some mistakes you've seen, uh, and those can come from anywhere across the world and the industry? Sure. Uh, I would like to start off by highlighting the fact that um, Thailand is one of the most advanced uh, countries, apart from Hong Kong, for digital asset uh, regulations. Uh, BitCup uh, has uh, been licensed for uh, almost six years now. And we have um, been able to get to the point that uh, almost 7% of all the Thai population own crypto legally. And thanks to regulations, um, we did not have any issues with you know, the previous years of the black swan of FTX, Luna, all these dominoes impacts. So uh, we were one, of, were one of the most uh, resilient uh, exchanges that survived you know, the previous um, black swan. Um, and, uh, but also, uh, I think it's important to uh, highlight that um, after the FTX event and the Luna incident, uh, those guys were messing up the space, but the regulated players are being punished even more with stricter regulations coming in. And now there, there are regulations arbitrage happening uh, where we are bringing, almost bring, forcing the regulated players to bring a knife to a gunfight because of the previous year's incident. So, you know, there, there are two, you know, there are good and bad, right? Um, because of the stable regulations, we were able to grow the business, you know, uh, in a stable manner. And our $1 revenue generated is very different from $1 generated from the unregulated, exchange, unregulated exchanges. I've been in this space for also uh, 10 years. And there were two business models when it comes to running an exchange. The first philosophy was to move fast, break things, and apologize later. You know, those Binance and FTX. Yep. And, yep. and it's proven that it's a wrong strategy, and they're no, no longer here today. Right? And then there's a, a second path that we take things a bit slower. We, we manage to balance the amount of different, different stakeholders. We, we comply from day one. Um, and I think the, the whole world is shifting towards this second strategy, towards running a proper infrastructure in a compliant way. And it suits the next wave too. I would like to add further from Brad and, and Michael that the next wave would be probably driven by institutional money, which is like real serious money entering the space, not just retail customers. And as a prerequisite of those institutional funds, they cannot invest in something illegal or invest in infrastructure that are not well operate, you know, with, with good operations or security, uh, not uh, of the highest security, uh, security standard. So I think the discussion we, ha we are having today is very important uh, in moving the whole industry forward. What has to happen for that institutional, the real large flow of institutional money to start coming in, or has it already happened with the, the ruling earlier this month? I would like to add uh, quick, quickly, there, I think there are two, two words here, nice to have and, and a must have. Right? Um, you know, what uh, many people thought that you know, institutional would be entering the space if you have a, you know, flexibility of the product or the highest liquidity or whatever the best product out there, right? That's uh, the nice to have feature. But we also have to meet the must have or, or the prerequisites uh, in, or, in order for institutional money to enter the space. For, for example, we have to uh, work on the standardization of regulation across uh, the world. For example, in the US, you, were having, uh, you guys were having issues with the definition of uh, Bitcoin versus altcoin is security, whereas in Thailand we have a totally different definition of different types of tokens already, and, you know, it's been stabilized from day one. So I think we need to fix on, this, uh, on the taxonomy, on the standardization across, uh, on how to regulate the space, on st the standardization of how to scale, uh, scale this technology across. I think that's the first stepping stone. Uh, and once we have a stable regulation, we have a good security uh, infrastructure, then institutional money will, will be entering the space. But, but. Yeah, I think in many ways there's you know perpetually been this hunt for institutionalization of crypto, institutional assets moving into crypto. Um, I can say firsthand we've 
seen quite a bit of that over the last few years already. Um, you know, whether that's, you know, having some of the world's largest pension funds or endowments as clients of ours that are investing in crypto, um, or now seeing, you know, to Brad's point, some of the world's largest, if not the largest asset managers globally, now publicly not only advancing their plans, but also actually offering products in this ecosystem, um, I think is a really strong signal of the institutionalization of the asset class. I do think, though, a part of the conversation that's missing is around how soon institutions may be directly involved in owning and holding crypto assets directly versus when they're going to rely on intermediaries or investment products, et cetera. And I think sometimes we forget that there are rules that institutions often have to follow about not being self-custodied um, when it comes to you know, overseeing and administering client assets. In fact, they have to use third-party custodians, right? They have to have prime brokerage relationships et cetera. And so I certainly believe having, you know, for instance, Bitcoin ETFs can be a big propellant to getting more institutions involved um, and set against that backdrop. We also need more regulatory clarity. Um, you know, long gone, I think, are the days of institutional investors having, you know, career risk, walking into an investment committee meeting, suggesting that the investment committee begins to invest or explore digital assets. Um, but there still needs to be more regulatory clarity, I think, to get further buy-in when you start to look at how institutions are thinking about allocating. Thanks. Uh, Inga, let me go to you here with a question about CBDCs. Um, so what will be the importance of the CBDC policy, um, specifically the digital euro policy, um, on payment service providers um, that provides different that provide different types of digital assets. Um, thank you. Um, I think it's essential to say that uh, when we talk about digital assets, we also talk about central bank digital currencies that will be introduced. And looking at the MICA uh, regulations introduction last year by the European uh, Commission was really refreshing because obviously having cryptocurrencies regulated will also ensure that there is a larger adoption of other assets and understanding by the end user. In the end of the day, we all need to protect end user, whether it's uh, central bank digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, or stable coins. Nevertheless, the digital euro policy, which was uh, published uh, by the European Commission also in the, uh, June 2023, which is quite similar with the MICA introduction, will impact all the payment services providers. So if your clients will be uh, able to withdraw money in fiat currency and euro currency, they will also need to get compliant with digital euro policy and PSD2. So I think this is really essential for crypto companies also prepared for the future, for multi-digital assets future, when we'll have interoperability between different types of assets. Wholesale CBDCs, retail CBDCs, uh, cryptocurrencies which are regulated, so actually getting uh, uh, rid of all those cryptocurrencies that actually made uh, crypto so unpopular over the last 12 months, as well as regulated stable coins. And the regulatory preparation, uh, from my perspective, should be definitely more vocal about getting all the financial intermediaries prepared for multi-digital uh, assets future. In the end of the day, there is a place for uh, every type of asset, whether it's a legal tender in the form of central bank uh, digital uh, currencies or cryptocurrencies or stable coins, depending on the jurisdictions. Nevertheless, I know it will be a quite significant challenge for financial intermediaries to ensure multi-interoperability and also ensure uh, common standards. There's a lot of work uh, ongoing right now on thinking how to tackle wholesale CBDCs, whether there can be a common cross-border standard that will support international intermediaries in the, uh, in the uh, processing of CBDCs across different type of assets, for instance, by pension funds, which you mentioned. This is exactly coming the way of the biggest companies right now, and they already started working uh, uh, on how they could address this from the policy perspective, also contributing to market advisory groups in the case of uh, Digital Euro uh, project conducted over the last two years, as well as from the technology perspective, not being in the position of, of ending up with multiple systems which cannot actually uh, 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 exchange the currencies between each other, and then automatically impacting the end user with high cost or really delayed payments. Thank you. Um, Paul, uh, can we go back to the uh, task force? Uh, what are your goals for that? We well, we set up a task force to uh, oversee the development of uh, Web3. 
Uh, the way we see it is that you know, virtual assets basically uh, fi financial innovation based on the uh, blockchain technology. And this will enable low cost, secure uh, financial innovations to be made possible. Uh, this is something that we have to embrace. Although in the digital asset uh, space, uh, here and there from time to time have some controversies. Uh, but this is going to be there. We should put them into a framework so, so that uh, it is properly regulated to enable them to have a sustainable and responsible development. Um, so set up this task force, we involve not just the government departments or the financial regulators, but also industry players. So that in the process, although we, we said the regulatory philosophy is same activity, same risk, same uh, regulation, but in practical terms, there are a lot to be clarified. And this space is moving very fast. So having industry players in the task force is important. And also in the process, we need, if this sector is to prosper, we need to have suitable infrastructure. Uh, also, the related uh, services, say for example, custodian. Uh, we, we want to regulate the exchanges uh, we do not want people at one hand uh, running an exchange, but at the same time being the custodian or handling the funds of the clients. This is totally unacceptable. So we need to separate all this. But when it comes to custodian, who should be the right custodian? Uh, are the mainstream uh, custodians interested in this space? Uh, we have observed increasing interest. Yeah, but. I mean, this is some of the example that uh, through interactive discussions with the industry, knowing their needs, and trying to give a helping hand, that would enable the sector to prosper. As simple as for some of those VA companies in the initial stage, opening a bank account is a challenge. Mm. That shouldn't be the case. Yeah. So that is where we can step in to help. I had a question, a follow-up in mind, which was sort of what keeps you up at night about this not working? Like, what are the things that you're working on here that you see as the biggest challenges, the biggest things that have the potential to sort of, you know, tank the effort or just kind of not make it work? Is it that issue of the custodial funds? Like, who's uh, No, it is investor protection. But in, in terms of risks uh, from, for us as a regulator, number one, ensure financial stability. Okay, that, that one, I'm pretty confident. And uh, apart from setting out the rules, we have uh, regulators to do the inspections, we stress test the operators, that is okay. But in terms of investor protection, there are so many unlicensed operator. Uh, for the investing public, many of them may not be able to distinguish. So investor education is, is also very important. But from a, apart from investor education, uh, if there is any incidence of substantial investor losing money cases, then the government is under tremendous pressure. So that is something that we, we need to always stay vigilant and be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to the end of the, the row here. Um, either one of you guys can take this, but um, you know, I know in Tobin, you've been in the industry for roughly the same time as well, but for so long now, so much of the criticism of crypto focuses on the use case argument. Like there's nothing to do with it. You know, People talk about, oh, it's being used in this way over here and in that way over there. And then you hear the critics say like, yeah, but that's not like you're really grasping at straws there. Um, you know, uh, and, and that it's just all about financial speculation and, and, and that's it. So um, I wanted to get your sense of, you know, kind of how you feel about that argument in general, but especially how you feel about that argument now uh, and where we are in the sort of development of the market. Do you think it's fair? What is your response to it? I, I think it's a valid argument. Uh, I mean, as I said earlier, I think 2024, 
I think we really do as an industry, and as Michael kind of highlighted, you know, that when you go through these what we, we have called crypto winters, it's an opportunity to build. And I think you're seeing more of that. And there are more leading companies emerging. Uh, I mean, Ripple's now at a place where we have focused on real utility of solving a cross-border settlement problem. We've invested heavily in the custodial area. Circle, who I know is in the audience, has definitely demonstrated a real-world use case. I think Fluency, like these are, we're solving problems that people see with these technologies. But I agree, you know, what has driven the non-crypto, well, some of crypto winters are a reaction to an overhyped cycle of euphoria enthusiasm, which is just speculation. And I think what we haven't seen yet that I still think we will eventually see is a separation of wheat and chaff of, you know, what are the assets, how are these technologies being used to solve real problems that have real demand versus ones, you know, I'll, I'll pick on Dogecoin. I don't get it. You know, other than Elon Musk as the central actor, you know, uh, I don't see the the use case and the purpose. Uh, and I'm sure I'll get lots of shit for saying that Dogecoin's not. Uh, but you know, oh well. Yeah. yeah, I guess just having fun is a use case. I don't. Sure, know. I guess yeah. <laughs> entertainment. That yeah. counts. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I would just add to that um, that. I think it's somewhat frustrating being inside the crypto ecosystem to sometimes have this, you know, somewhat of an impatience um, around the development of these use cases. I think we sometimes forget to take that step back, look at really just how short a period of time as a technology, crypto and blockchain has really been functionally functioning successfully. Um, and when I look back on my 10 years in crypto, I can't even begin to think of the number of use cases or developments that have happened in crypto that were never conceived before as crypto you know, came on the scene. We were never talking about NFTs. We were never talking about ICOs and you know, the democratization of capital formation. We weren't talking about ordinals. We weren't talking um, about you know, a, a lot of the you know, different innovations that have come along. And so when I think about where we are today, um, as we're seeing greater maturation, greater institutionalization of crypto, it is very exciting to sit in our seats, seeing more capital flow into crypto, meaning that crypto will have a larger monetary base. A larger monetary base means more people paying attention to crypto, more people being involved in crypto, which I believe creates somewhat of a flywheel effect where it actually leads to further development activity and totally new use cases that hopefully at the next Davos or the Davos after that, we're gonna be talking about other use cases that weren't even conceived of. Um, and so I like to just kind of remind ourselves to have that kind of perspective over just how short a period of time it's been. Um, but nonetheless, I also think certainly with, you know, a US centric view of crypto where my company mostly operates, most of the investment going into crypto today is looking at crypto as a technology or crypto assets as a store of value. Um, and that's not inherently a bad thing. Um, it doesn't somehow need to, um, you know, overtake other financial innovations that we've had historically. Um, we're still well on our way to ultimately, I think, finding some of the killer use cases for Bitcoin and other assets as well. I'll just throw out real quick. I think some of the coolest stuff going on that's nascent around real utility use cases is happening outside the United States in places like Hong Kong or Singapore or Dubai where there is clear regulatory frameworks. Most of the people who work in crypto want to follow the rules there have to be clear rules. We right. talk a lot about the US regulatory environment for good <laughs> reasons, uh, but I think we, sometimes we don't talk enough about all of the constructive stuff going on outside the US, including Thailand. Yeah, well, Todd yeah. looked like he wanted to jump in. Well, so and just on the, yeah, please. on the comment that you were making earlier about what you're doing in Hong Kong, that's a really refreshing perspective for me to sit here and be hearing. Um, you know, when I look at what's happened there, what's happened in Singapore, the idea that there are these regulatory sandboxes in different jurisdictions where there's actual collaboration between the public and private sector and that development can go on without fear of some kind of retaliation um, against you, I think that really leads to good outcomes. So um, just want to congratulate you on that work. I think it's great. Thank you. Actually, recently our Hong Kong Monetary Authority issue tokenized green bonds. So we, we try to lead by example in a way. Uh, this is use case, very obvious. And uh, apart from that, we just wrote out a consultation paper about stablecoin. Uh, we think uh, by doing this, we will step by step uh, lead the investing public and in the process, educational to, to our own people about the development in this space. Uh, initially, what not very ambitious, it is fiat reference stable coins, but at least this is a step forward. And we believe the innovations will be from the market. Yeah. 
Ingo. If I could add also from the technology perspective, I think there's a lot of misconception about blockchain and uh, throwing it together with crypto into one basket, in my opinion, is not the best way to go. Specifically, as you've mentioned, Brad, due to really bad marketing of some of the Doge coins and other coins that have appeared in the market and actually made the perceivance that crypto is something really bad. In the end of the day, blockchain is an innovative technology which has actually multiple uh, possibilities to be applied to uh, in the financial services without really bad cryptocurrencies. With the, uh, with the introduction of proper regulations, which we're seeing across the globe, including European Union, I truly believe there will be a coexistence of digital assets with the protection of the end user. And we still will be able to treat blockchain also separately, not specifically for crypto, specifically for stable coins, but also for different purposes to ensure that actually there's the future of finance and we can apply not only blockchain, but AI and make the services better. Because in the end of the day, all comes down to the end user experience and to the end user uh, uh, ability of being able to choose any type of assets or legal tenders they would like to pay with. Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing to go back to something you said earlier, Brad, was um, the fact that 2023, that, that Bitcoin and other uh, currencies grew as much as they did while, you know, uh, Shit was hitting the fan. Shit was hitting the fan all over the place. It suggests that the public is getting a little more sophisticated about understanding that, you know, the whole like, ah, they're all criminals. Like, no, there's some criminals and we know who they are and everybody else is just trying to create a new financial system. So that seems like an encouraging sign. Top, I think you wanted to jump in there. I, did, I wanted to make sure you had a chance to. Yes, I had uh, three points earlier um, on why there were no real use cases in, in crypto and blockchain. And my first point was similar to what Brad said earlier. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency was in a gray area, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't really unlock full potential if something is illegal, right? You can't bring in the whole workforce to help and innovate. But, uh, and this is why we have to f fix on the first issue on the standardization of regulation across the world. So that, you know, serious money, serious talents can actually come and help and innovate on real use cases. For example, in Thailand, once we have um, legalized uh, the whole space, uh, there are two major banks now acting as a you know, service pro cryptocurrency service provider in the country. So I'm sure there'll be new innovations happening soon. That was my first point. And my second point uh, is that um, you know, ETFs is acting as an, a, a catalyst. We're at the inflection point now. There'll be an order of magnitude more financial products built on top of digital assets soon. So it, it is very important that we make sure that the regulations that we are pushing out, we will not be destroying innovations also at the same time. We have to strike the right balance between you know, innovating and also customers' protection. And to add on um, financial secretary uh, point, uh, apart from listening to the private uh, players you know, to co-create uh, regulations uh, together, I think even the regulators themselves, they need to uh, take courses. For example, I met you know, with a Cambridge University here. They've been training hundreds and hundreds of um, regulators across the world on you know, digital asset regulations. You know, to, uh, to regulate football, you know, FIFA has to play football before. Right? Right. So it's also important to not just also listen to industry players, but also the regulators themselves need to know, need to know how to wire Bitcoin, you know, public-private key. They need to actually experiment and try themselves too and take courses. And my third point is that uh, it's not one size fits all. You know, um, real use cases will probably happen uh, more in Asia, where there are no legacy financial legacy system. We can really leapfrog the West because there's no opportunity. The opportunity cost is not as, as much. And the demo, uh, demographic and the foundation uh, are, are very different. For example, half of the people in the ASEAN um, you know, countries have no bank account. We have issues with unbanked, with underbanked. So these blockchain applications are, are su more suitable for you know, the, some, some geo you know, location more than the others. And lastly, um, uh, um, I forgot my point there. <laughs> that was pretty good up to that point. You had, you had the points <laughs> going. You got through the well first done. three. So um, that 7% of the country uh, in, have invested in Bitcoin, 
Um, do, do you know where where that falls worldwide? Like where that ranks? If other countries have, do you do you know? That seems very high. So I'm just curious. The, the U.S. is 20 percent. I think, oh, I think close it's to higher. I think it's like 25. Like one in four Americans, I think, owns crypto. I, I have read, which I can't validate. I think Turkey, what I've read, is the highest penetration, and there's obviously local dynamics that impact that from a political basis. But all right, um, we've talked a bit about compliance. We've talked a lot about compliance, um, and there's a lot of sort of pressure or, or, or interest. Maybe pressure the, the, connotes the wrong thing, but um, of adopting a compliance-first mindset, but. Um, what is what does a compliance first mindset kind of look like when uh, you know everything is so sort of different, decentralized, global? Um, uh, you mentioned being frustrated earlier, Michael. I mean, is that is that a source of frustration um, for you to sort of uh, kind of receive that guidance without the specific information in place to follow it? Well, again, I think my answer is going to be, you know, somewhat U.S. centric, but I'd say that, you know, my business in particular is an asset manager first and foremost. It just so happens that crypto is our specialty, and so our our you know way of operating has always been about asking for permission, um, not necessarily for forgiveness, right? And so we have had to, within the confines of existing securities laws, um, continue to develop products and services for clients, and these securities laws at this point um, are nearly 100 years old um, in the United States. Um, and so as a result of that, and the way that you know everyone else on the panel is speaking, the innovations in crypto are obviously very much so outpacing um, the speed at which regulatory you know, considerations can kind of keep, keep up with it. And so I think as a result of that, if you want to be operating a compliant business, you need to do everything you can to engage on a regulatory front. You have to bridge the educational kind of knowledge gap that exists there because this is just one tiny, tiny area that regulators are looking at um, and legislators are looking at. And for us, that's been really key to you know our continued success. Um, but it's not going to be one size fits all. Um, and if there's one message I could kind of deliver out of this, and I think Brad said this before, most of the actors within crypto want to operate in a regulated manner. They want to operate regulated businesses. It will allow their businesses to flourish, to grow, to attract more capital, to attract more investors, um, et cetera. So anything we can do to kind of shake off the notion that you know crypto is entirely moving towards this ethos of anti-establishment or you know trying to work or, or be outside the, the rules, um, that's really not the case, um, at least from an inside perspective within the industry. I'll throw out one quick reaction. In your question, you said something about you know how is it different, and I, I, I'll say I think the question is wrong. Like it's not different. KYC, know your customer, still matters. Anti money laundering still matters. You know, in the U.S., you have OFAC and other. You know, I can't name all the acronyms, but I, it, I think if we start with the point of view that it's different, it's like I mean I think the the, the secretary said earlier. You know, if it's the same, let's regulate it the same. Like, and so I don't think it's that different. The other thing is a slightly off topic, but I, that we uh, glanced over. One of the things I think will happen if I were to predict 2024 and beyond, as big money, institutional money comes in, they, right now we have one ETF. I think people look at it as an asset class, and I think you will see other ETFs come. And I, by the way, this is an area where the US is behind. You know, Europe has had a Bitcoin, effectively a Bitcoin ETF for a few years. And I think you're going to see that uh, spread because people often, particularly if you're in an endowment or an institution, you're, you're not buying one stock. You're not buying one bond. Right. You're buying a basket and you're diversifying that risk. Um, I would love to open it up to questions now. Um, do we have a mic runner? Anyone have a question? I see one here. Hello, my name is Jimmy Alcazin, uh, living in Geneva. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I see all the time is that people confuse between Bitcoin and blockchain, and, and then people always look at the value of Bitcoin rather than what it does. And it, I think people need to be educated further because it's, it's, it's creating a whole... Uh, a whole uh, system where people are saying that bitcoins and blockchain is is, is attracting uh, all kind of uh, all kind of uh, complications, but it's in fact it's 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 quite simple. 
I mean, it's based on the internet, and uh, and people should uh, should embrace it rather than be afraid of it. And and it's all because people instantly uh, snapped on and uh, decided to to stipulate on the value of Bitcoin rather than see what it can do. You can do it. You can use it in the middle of the night. You can use it in the weekend. You, I mean, there's a whole of advantages that people are not seeing. I mean, that's 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 all I have to say. Thank you. So not a question. Okay. Do <laughs> have a question? Hi. <clears throat> this is great, great panel. Thank you. Um, I guess one question I have for the group is we've heard across the conversations a clear tension of the lack of regulatory clarity and harmonization, but it seems with many jurisdictions like Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, <coughs> UAE, Europe, and many others coming online, how is that reconciled? Is one question. The second question is, of course, crypto came on the scene as a technology that was going to make banks and Wall Street relevant. But as we learned through the US banking crisis, actually banks are a critical counterparty to the totality of the sector. And many banks don't want these technologies to work at the scale that they can. And so how do we also ensure that the banks follow suit? It would be the two questions that I have. Regulatory harmonization and what about those banks? Thank you. On the regulatory fund, I understand that uh, the international financial regulators, like IOSCO, uh, they are looking at this. Uh, in fact, from our experience, both uh, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the Securities and Futures Commissions are represented there and try to advocate uh, from, a, from a global standpoint, one standard. Uh, I think it is converging. Uh, this, this must be the trend if this sector is to grow. Anyone else care to? I think on regulatory harmonization, um, I think it's going to you know, settle itself. I don't think that there's gonna be an individual catalyst that's gonna harmonize that on a global level. Um, unfortunately, I think what's happening is that crypto businesses and products and services are geographically moving to jurisdictions that are acting in a more favorable manner for them. Um, and so, you know, ultimately, I think it starts to draw into competitiveness of the different capital markets that each of these geographies has, um, how friendly the regulators are gonna be, how much clarity they're gonna provide, and perhaps even what incentives they're going to offer to businesses, to developers, to be bringing their, their products and services into those countries. Um, I think you're, you're certainly seeing a lot of waking up, if you will, from a lot of regulatory bodies in different geographies. And although I think it's sometimes um, we may believe that they're not in communication with one another. Our experience is that they actually do quite often compare notes, right? And that capital markets are inextricably tied on a global level. Yeah, on, on the acceptance of traditional banks uh, with regard to uh, virtual assets, I think it is coming. Uh, say, for example, uh, we mentioned earlier about building the infrastructure, providing the custodian services. We see increasing interests uh, from global financial institutions uh, interested in acting in that capacity. And in fact, in Hong Kong, I think the Hong Kong MA has allowed the banks uh, to include, subject to certain regulations, say for example, uh, exposure, uh, to have virtual assets in their portfolio. I'll throw out, I think uh, the, the harmonization, I think, partly happens, you know, I'll use Ripple as an example. You know, we added well over 200 people last year, and something like 80, 75, 80% were non-US, in part because, like, why are we hiring people in the US where you have a hostile regulator? On the, the acceptance, I, I don't have the same optimism uh, as Paul expressed, only because I, I actually personally was debanked by a US bank where I think they're like, hey, he's in crypto, we're just, we're cutting him off. And you know, this is a, a, a scary thing when you think about the implications of that, but you have a, in the OCC, as you know well, a pretty hostile viewpoint, and when they go, as an OCC, the national regulator in the, the US for national banks, when they speak negatively of crypto and publish that, you know, the banks pull back. Uh, I, I continue to believe, unfortunately, and I think, frankly, a circle IPO would help provide some of the clarity because it would drive, uh, I think, likely stablecoin legislation in the United States, 
which would be a good thing. But I've remained pretty uh, pessimistic about the U.S., which is why I just you know Ripple is largely focused on non-U.S. customers. Uh, for me, um, I think harmonization uh, is much needed. Otherwise, there'll be a regulatory arbitrage happening. You, you know, the ones that are doing the uh, a well-run exchange uh, would be heavily regulated, for example, and there'll be some other, other countries, other jurisdiction with less uh, tight uh, re regulations. There'll be uh, you know bad actors taking advantage of that, and there'll be uh, decoupling happening uh, between unregulated versus regulated exchanges in terms of market share, and that's not going to be healthy. So I think we need standardization across the world. And from the European Union perspective, I agree actually with Brad. So I'm quite pessimistic looking at the Digital Euro Policy already announcement uh, uh, last year in terms of uh, preparation for the Digital Euro arrival. Uh, however, the MICA regulation is here to ensure that uh, the end user will not get affected by the introduction of cryptocurrencies or stable coins. That definitely is a step forward. Nevertheless, uh, uh, we'll see how this will roll out in the next two years uh, alongside digital euro, so CBDCs, cryptocurrencies, and stable coins coin existence. Okay, um, we are out of time. Um, thanks to the world economic. We, World Economic Forum. You can tell it's Thursday night at the end of this. Um, for hosting this, this event, um, thanks to this panel for all of your insights. Thanks to all of you for being here, uh, and have a great evening. <laughs>